Well, hey everybody, this is Angela Loria from the Author Incubator, and I am so excited you could join us for a conversation today with our featured author of the month, Mark J. Silverman. Mark, thanks hey, for everybody. joining us. Thank you. Mark is the author of Only Tens. I'm going to show it to you, but you probably can't see it. I'm going to show it to you times two. Maybe you'll be able to see it, or maybe it'll be all washed out, but trust me, it is called Only Tens. You can find it on Amazon. And in today's conversation, we're really going to talk about Mark's journey to making a difference with a book. And for Mark, really one of, I think, the most interesting and beneficial parts of the journey is that, like, Many people, he was very busy when the time came to write his book. Um, and like many people um, that we work with, he also faced the challenge of being distracted. Sometimes we talk about shiny object syndrome, so many amazing opportunities. Mark specifically has been diagnosed with ADD. Some of you may be diagnosed or not diagnosed, but we're going to talk today about how Mark was able to use distraction to actually get the right things done. And so I hope you will stay tuned. There are lots of nuggets along this journey. You will have the opportunity to really see from the inside. I know on the outside, things can look amazing. And there's this great line from AA where they talk about don't compare your insides to other people's outsides. So maybe you've seen Mark or another one of your friends or someone who got a book out in three months and they became a bestseller and they added $100,000 to their coaching practice and you're comparing your accomplishments to that, um, to that shiny photoshopped picture on the outside. Well, we're gonna peel all that back and we're gonna talk about the real journey and the real challenges. And Mark is part of our um, our series really exploring the authors who have worked with us who have made the, di the biggest difference with our message. And to each of these authors, we present the coveted um, Make a Difference Award. So this is our award to our authors. You probably can't see this either, but it will look lovely on your bookshelf. It's actually the shape of a book. Oh my God, I've been so, looking at that box going, I what wonder what's that? in there and I it's want whatever's you. in there. That, that's cool. That's, that, that's unexpected. That's awesome. Thank you. I got to give you a Oh my God. You know, I think <laughs> that so many people feel like they want to make a difference with a book, but actually doing it and not just writing it, hmm. but getting it in people's hands and being willing to face rejection, which hopefully isn't what happens, but you have to be able and willing to accept that, stops a lot of people from making a difference. So we highlight our authors of the month to show what's possible, to show that you're, you're not that different, especially a year ago, 18 months ago, when you started this journey, you're not that different than the people watching. You just made a decision. You know, just a guy in a Hugo Boss suit trying to figure out how to sit on a Victorian couch in a castle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk about where you were 18 months ago when we get on the phone for the first time. How did you come up with the idea to write a book? Where were you in your life? What was going on? So we really have to go back to how I got to where I was 18, years, okay. 18 months ago because before that I was a high-tech sales guy in the Washington, D.C. area. Very, very successful. Very high-pressure time consuming, you know, I had the, the two kids in the, in the big house and the you know, convertible sports car. And over time, what I realized- That's very cliche. I, so I was a walking <laughs> cliche. I had a Lexus convertible. It was awesome. Nice. Uh, until it got stuck in the snow. Oh. Um, but I, I, over time, I started to realize one of the reasons I was successful in sales is because I was helping my customers get where they wanted to go. I was helping them solve problems. I was helping them build their business. I was always always helping my colleagues in, in, in helping their sales careers. That was my thing. Uh, when I started to realize that the wheels were coming off my nervous system mm. being in that world, 
And I just, I, it wasn't what I wanted to do. Well, with what, when you say the wheels were coming off your nervous system, was it the pressure of a quota or was it more like internal politics, bureaucracy, not being able to do all of all, all of, of all of that? And it, but the other thing is also why I would write a book called Only Tens. It wasn't a 10 for me. What had driven me for years was fear, fear of failure, fear of looking bad. So that drove me to become wildly successful in sales. When I was no longer cared about that, that juice to go do that was no longer there. I was much more interested in coaching my colleagues and getting their sales numbers up. I was much, I was always fascinated and, and into what my, my customers needed. So I, did, I was doing a lot of spiritual self-help work at that time. Uh, and I, I, I happened upon someone who had a coaching uh, program and he had, said he had a hunch that I should really do his program and I didn't even know what coaching was. So I did that program figured out, oh, this is what I've been doing my whole life. It's what I want to do, nothing. But you actually quit your corporate job, and I think I see a lot of people who, I'm gonna quit my corporate job when I'm making, mm -hmm. what, when I replace my salary, I think is the way I hear them say it. Yes. And I don't think you had replaced your salary. Obviously, it's harder to replace a DC sales guy salary than a dental hygienist in Idaho salary. But I don't think you'd come anywhere close to replacing your salary when you quit your job. No, I hadn't. I, in fact, I, I didn't have any paying clients. I just knew this is what I was going to do, and it's kind of what I do. If, I, if there's a direction for me to go, so I, I wound up quitting my job. Uh, it was really cool. The company I was working for didn't. They said, "Please, while you're doing your training, stay with us through the new year." Uh, just kind of unheard of as a sales guy for them not to let you go. But they Usually said, they very they said, nicely walk you out the no, door. They, they, <laughs> wanted, they wanted me to help find my replacement, keep the customers that we had going, and go off on my trainings and do all that stuff. Uh, so that was really nice. But I found myself, you know, I was a year into this coaching thing where I had left my job. I had a full practice, but I had a full practice of people who I wasn't charging the money I needed to charge to make a living and support my family and, uh, and my expenses because I really wanted to hone my craft. I really wanted to master this coaching and consulting world before I actually took people's money for it. Uh, the cool thing was this moment I said I was going to be a coach, I had uh, six clients. Like six people came out of the woodwork and said, whatever you're doing, don't even know what coaching is, want to be, want to be your client. Uh, how much do you charge? I'm like, uh, I don't know, 1500 bucks or something. Yeah, good, something like that. So that was kind of cool, but, that, but a year into that journey, I was really learning what my craft, learning what my message is, what I was doing for people. But there are certain things to do when you're an entrepreneur, when, you know, to grow a business. Coaches, one, one of the reasons people as coaches fail is because they're really good at helping people get where they need to be, but they're not good at running a business. Mm. There's a lot going into building, building an entrepreneurial business. And that's where this only tens came in. So I, I had a whole business plan that I was running. But because I'm ADD and because I don't like doing what I don't like to do, a lot of things weren't getting done. <laughs> so I was working with my coach, uh, Rich Litvin, uh, who you and I know wrote The Prosperous Coach. Mm -hmm. And one day I... Huge fan of that book, by the way. If you're a coach and you haven't read The Prosperous Coach, just get that and do everything in there. So I was talking to Rich one day and I said to him, I know what my business plan is. I take my Adderall every day. I put on my ADD music. I sit down at my desk and I'm not getting what I want done, done. I just can't get it done. I don't understand this is really bad because I've left my job, I'm living mostly out of savings and I really need to grow this business. And Rich said that we had the bright ideas. What if you used this distraction as a compass instead of a, a problem? And my tagline to that is I'd be living under a bridge, my kids would start right. and the whole thing would go down. He said, no more. One thing I know about you, when you really want to do something, you do it. When you wanted to run a marathon, nothing stopped you. You trained for and ran a marathon in a year without being able to run a mile. When you wanted to make a million dollars, you made a million dollars. And what about like, did you, in your sales job, did you have quotas? I had quotas. How often did you not hit your quota? Uh, not very. I almost always missed the first quarter of every year because I always had a really good year uh -huh. and I just didn't really care. And then like, yeah, but I, won. Uh, but uh, I had, I, I had pretty much success every year and I made a, a lot of money. So you had all this 
evidence that if you wanted to do something, you could. You clearly felt like you wanted to start a coaching practice. You quit your job, so there had to be, you know, with two kids, I, I know you take care of your mom, car expenses, house expenses, like you clearly wanted to make the coaching business work. Why the hell weren't you just doing it? Because there were certain tasks that just weren't things I wanted to do. And there was also certain commitments I made with people that I that would seem like they would be a 10. Yeah. When that week after I talked to Rich, I went through everything that was on my list, everything that was in my business plan that seemed like, you know, they, they tell you how to build a coaching business. You need a website, you need to do this, you need to, you know, and partner with this person. And I realized that some of those things weren't a 10 for me. They were nine. They looked really cool. They sh I should be doing them, but I wasn't doing them. And when Rich said, you wanted to run a marathon, you ran a marathon, nothing stopped you. I said, you know, when the new iPhone comes out, I'm really busy, but I'm the first, I'm the first one that has one. So I drop everything when I want to do something. So that started to give me a clue that, oh, I actually do accomplish whatever it is my attention goes towards and I want to do. So that week, I really spent time slowing down and paying attention to what I was accomplishing, not accomplishing, what I was saying yes to, what I was saying no to. And what I learned was there were boundaries that I didn't set, hmm. that, I, that I never thought of setting because other people's priorities uh, were mine. You, you, you mentioned in one of our other talks uh, the, the matrix of, you know, urgent and important. Mm -hmm. Stephen you know, Covey from you know, Seven Habits. I love right. that. So urgent uh, but important. And for me, everybody else's stuff was always up in that mm -hmm. corner. Or avoiding a fear. So for me, one of the reasons I was always successful as a sales guy is because I didn't want to not, I did not want, want to get the, the finger pointed at me for not being. So I was scared of not overachieving at the end. Everyone's of the done a good job except for Mark Silverman. So that was the 10 for me. <laughs> So that was what was up in so the So why wasn't that working anymore? Because again, I wasn't, it wasn't work, it worked in sales. It wasn't working towards the end because I just, you know, I was kind of like a baseball player who was moving towards the end of his career. So I want to go into management and because management is kind of a coach. That's kind of a coaching, really. But I didn't, I didn't like the pressure. You know, I love coaching managers. Mm -hmm. uh, sales managers are fun because they got the pressure from the bottom and they got the pressure from the top and I love helping them deal with that. But I knew I didn't want to be that person. Uh, so as I went through the week, I started really slowing down and learning about myself. And I went, you know, I actually do know what I want to do. I, do, I don't have a problem making choices and decisions. I have all these distractions that look like they're mine and they're not really mine. Mm. So I started playing with this for a week, then two, and I started letting things go. I started having conversations with someone, people and saying, you know, I agreed to do this with you and you're really important to me, but I don't wanna do this. So how did you overcome the fear of like people hating you? Like so there's a chapter in there called courage. <sighs> I need to be, cause again, so being a people pleaser and being someone who's always Johnny in the spot for everybody in their life, you collect people who are used to that. A lot of people fell away. Mm. There's a lot of people's phone calls that I stopped automatically picking up and listening to for an hour and a half that stopped calling me. Other people started coming into my life who were much more of the same ilk as me. But the people who loved me and who were really with me but were used to that adjusted. Hmm. I mean, people, people look, if, and, and I learned to be graceful about my boundary setting. So I, and then I started learning what were my fears. What about with your kids? Because I know you're a dad. Um, boundary setting with your kids sounds really hard because they probably expected you to do whatever you've done. Take them to games or whatever. And growing up in status symbol land here where we, where, we, where we live, you're at every single baseball game. You never miss a thing. And if your kid needs a backpack, he gets a backpack. And if your kid needs, you know, so that's not good for them. So actually, my journey was really good for them. You know what? I'm going to be at two of your baseball games this week. I'm not going to be at four of your baseball games because I have, I'm building a business. I have things to do. Or I just want to go out and do something different. And that really started to shift uh, my relationship with people. I started getting like this. And it, 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 the respect and the dynamic of the relationship really grew.
Mm. All, all of these are unexpected byproducts of just trying to get my stuff done. Mm. So I, I, you know, using distraction to get the right stuff done, I just wanted to get stuff done. And what I learned was, oh my God, I do so many things because I think I should be doing them mm. or because I don't want to look bad or because of fears or avoiding fears that I started slowing things down and seeing the thought processes and, and, and starting to be able to parse them out. So then I started getting room and mark and my personality started growing so that I knew who I was. I know what I want to do. I know what choices I need to make. I know what I need to say no and I know what I need to say yes. And I know what I need to say yes to something I don't even want to do because that person is a 10 for me. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'll, I will help you because I love you and I care for you and I really uh, value this relationship. But I don't want to do whatever it is this is. So I started learning those things. That's when the book came in. All right, so how did you get the idea, I want to write a book? So, so the, you know, a couple weeks later, I was talking to Rich, and I said, this is amazing. I am getting so much done. It is, I'm blowing my, I'm even paying my bills and, you know, keeping, <laughs> I'm doing all this stuff, and my, you know, I actually got clients that week, and it was really cool. Uh, I said, I think I'm going to write a book. I really want to get a PhD. I'm going to spend the summer. My kids are going off to the beach with their mom. I'm going to get a PhD in this subject matter of learning Mark. Mm. And, and I'm going to write a book. And uh, Rich said, that's a great idea. I think you should write a book. Uh, and then I went for a walk with um, Robin Thompson. Your, Which was total coincidence. You total just coincidence. happened to meet someone on have, my team. And we, and we both have black dogs. So we went for a walk. And I said, Robin, I just had an idea. I want to write a book. And he goes, funny you should say that you need to meet Angela. And I was like, okay, and told me about it. We talked like a week later. I was, you know, you, you were really on board with the concept of the book, which really was validating to me, which thank you very much. Because I was writing this book for myself. I didn't think anybody would read it. I didn't even know who would get published. But your excitement and your focus on what it is I was talking about really helped me go, yeah, I'm going to write a book. Now, before this moment where you get the idea to write a book, had you ever thought about writing a book before? Uh, people have told me for years I should write a book about my life. Okay. And I don't want to write a book oh. about my life. I kind of want to hear it though. But um, <laughs> we need to talk about that off camera. So people would say to you, you should write a book. And what was your thought when people would say you should write a book? Like that's never going to happen or? I, I, I how would know. I ever write a book? I can't even get my bills out the door even though I have the money. Right. How am I going to write a book? Uh, so yeah, no, that, that I didn't know how that was ever going to work. I, was, so, I, I actually thought of a shadow writer or something. You know, oh, you know. uh huh. When you called me, did you think we did ghostwriting? No, sometimes no, no. people think we do. No, that. no, no. That was for the book about my life. This book, yeah. I knew. I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to because you this. wanted the experience of writing it. Which right. So, what would you say before we talked? Before you even knew about us, was your confidence level that you were going to finish this book? So given that it was only a day, yes. seren serendipity Crazy. was like that, um, my confidence level was I was going to have a Word document that was going to be really useful for me. Mm -hmm. And that I would have a manuscript that sat on my hard drive for years. Okay. That's, what, that's what I figured would happen. Rich would read it and go, oh, that's really cool, Mark, and maybe I'd let, you know. But I also, you know, I, I, it, it was really hard to let people see what I wrote or my artwork or anything like that. So the thought of writing a book and putting it out in the world and saying I'm an author, that's a little daunting. Mm -hmm. And not something you would always imagine for yourself. You didn't see yourself as a writer. No, I didn't see myself as famous and, and a writer and a speaker and all that stuff. And now I'm on stage and I wrote a book. And so, so that whole 18 months later thing is really kind of interesting. Right. So you made a decision pretty quickly. I mean, I think we were on the phone and you were signed up. It was definitely within an hour. You said 15 minutes, somewhere in there. Well, we take like, my energy express. Like, take my please, express. how do I give you my money? Um, what three months later you had a book what were those three months like for you was it all super easy you signed up you gave me your money you had a book it was so all... i ignored i <laughs> we talked about this before i ignored the instructions for the first month how'd that work out for you i have ADD. <laughs> uh you said all the instructions are in this folder go read the instructions and i couldn't find it you know i called my editor and i'm like what instructions were marked in the folder right here okay. so that gave me two months okay um, <laughs> um 
and we talked about that because my mother had moved to town, uh, my elderly mother, and there was a lot of things going on at that point. But this... I will say though, because we're laughing now in retrospect, and I remember all those moments. You were never, you never said this book isn't happening to me. You know, never. whenever you would say I can't find the files, it was like. I'm behind, I gotta catch up, my mom came, I didn't expect her to, what do I do right now? Yes. There was never a, I don't think this can happen, can I have my money back, uh, this was too hard for me, I have ADD. You would say I have ADD, but it was like, I have ADD, you have to tell me again where that file Files, is. Yes. And Kate, you know, I have to shout out to Kate. She's amazing. The, that woman held my hand and went, okay, come back here, mm -hmm. it's right here, you know, and, and so that was really, really helpful. But again, it's a compressed amount of time to do something that's pretty daunting that people, most people won't get done in their lives. So for, for me, the process of sitting down, writing a thousand words, 10,000 words, whatever it was that day, because you said, how many words a day do you write? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't know and I'm never gonna find out. Because <laughs> some days I'll sit at the computer for two hours and some days five minutes and I'm you know off to feed my fish. Um, but. Going through the summer, having the weekly calls, having my cohort of people that I was writing book, a book with, because we had other people who were also, you know, putting on the Facebook page, I can't write today, I can't write a book, I, you know, that was so And everybody was and, writing their own book, so yes. you, because I know you also did a compilation at the same time, but... Oh, yeah, that... that right, was, and, but these more. authors were each writing their own book, totally individual journeys, and yet so many similarities, like... So many similarities, and... and, and I could see in them that they were going to be fine. Mm -hmm. They could see in me that I was going to be fine, but I couldn't see in me that I was going to be fine. You know, I was absolutely sure that I was the only, you said I have mm -hmm. never had no, somebody not published. And I'm going to be the guy. I'm pretty sure it's going to be me. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, especially as we got closer to the date. So, you know, great. I had all these great chapters and all this stuff, but I had no idea how they should go and, you know, where everything and you know and Kate would say okay Mark I need you to finalize these things and tell me these are good and I'm like I've never read a term paper a second time I write it and put it in so you know so I had to have a team of people who would look at my stuff and decide whether it was good and, they, and then go back and make edit again having ADD you finish something you want to be done with it I don't like going there's a new it. squirrel to chase there's fish I to be do fed not, there's you know, dogs to be walked I was done with my book the week after I said I was going to write a book <laughs> you know <laughs> so so getting it to the finish line that was that was to me I have to say a bona fide miracle going to getting to the finish line like that day when that final proof comes back and the covers done and the chapters and it, even though it's a PDF it's a book and that sense of accomplishment to me was worth it. Like everything just disappeared and my product was right there. I wrote a book. Whether it's good or not, who knows, but I wrote a book. So throughout the three months for you and for everybody, by the way, there were many obstacles. I know you had some family obligations. Obviously, we've talked about some of your ADD challenges. You had um, maybe a little bit of a confidence challenge about your idea and your writing. Like there were lots of reasons that you could have not finished this. There were, I am 100% sure if you went back to Rich and said, signed up for this program, but just decided I'm going to turn this into a blog post instead. Like the world would have kept spinning on its axis, right? So there's plenty of ways you could have gotten out of this. Why do you think you were able to finish? And yes, I know some of that was the group and my coaching and Kate and like some of those factors, but just internally, why do you think you were able to stick? Because of the process of only tens. Mm. I, had, I had pared everything in my life down to three things. I had a presentation to give in front of a few hundred people in September. And it was, it, to me, it was my, you know, my several, uh, I talked about being, trying, working on mastering my craft over two years, working as Rich's Apprentice for two years. And, and it, to me, that September when we published was going to be my time where I said, you know what, I am now a professional coach. 
this is now my profession, who I am, what I do in the world. Uh, I'm no longer just, I'm always a student, but I'm no longer just a student and a sponge. I am now where I need to be. So September for me was going to be uh, doing this presentation, which I spent all summer working on, which part of the presentation was learning the guitar, and playing the guitar, and singing on stage mm -hmm. for the first time because I don't sing in public. Uh, so I was learning the guitar. At this, so it's a lot of creative stuff at the same time, and and writing this book. And I had one other ten, and now I don't even remember what that was. But I, I pared it down to three things that September for me was just going to be huge. And even if I flopped, if the book, f and I also decided if the book flopped, mm. if I flopped on stage, because I was sure I was going to flop on stage, what I was doing was crazy, uh, that didn't matter to me. These are my tens. I know they're my tens because I, I, I know my process and I'm going to do them. So that's what got me. Were there, okay, so you make it sound super easy, but what happens when you say the, the book and the speech are my tens and then your mom gets sick or there's a car accident. And my mother was, they, my mother right. was sick there and that, yes. So, so let me tell you, this, it's twofold there. Okay. So the, the, first, the, first, the first point is it actually is super easy when I start to cull away a lot of the other stuff. So much is so much easier when I get rid of the, what I call false tens and the distractions and the things that aren't real in my life. That makes going through the tough thing, like running a marathon when my knees hurt and my back hurt, or writing a book when, when I bring my mother to town and she's in a health crisis in a new place and freaked out, and I have to I have a deadline of this book. When everything else is cleared out, it gets I can now put all my energy into going over those hurdles that are so that would be so difficult. Um, so. I forgot the original But do you, like, question. this is what I see happening for people. They'll tell me my priority is getting my coaching business to 10K a month. And then something will happen. Something is required of them to do that, like making sales calls. And so then they'll be like, I said I wanted to get my coaching business to 10K a month, but really what I want to do is... Just, I just want to help people. So I don't care if I'm helping people for free. I just want to help people. And then they go and they're doing helping people. And then they're like, oh, I can't pay my bills. So it seems like people's tens are like always shifting. No, it's they're paying attention to stuff that aren't their tens. And they don't know what their real ten is. Mm. They don't know what the real ten is to get them through. So for me, I know that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow through my numbers as a sales guy. Because I don't want to look bad at the end of the quarter. I know my 10 is looking bad. It's not making the sales. It's not the nice car. It's not looking bad. It's not telling my wife, oh my God, I didn't bring home this amount of money. This, this time. That's my 10. As that shifts, and I'm less of a people pleaser, things are different. But that person who said I want to get, you know, that's, that's an 8. You know, I want to get my thing to, you know, right? I want to, how do I know writing a book was a 10? Yeah. It got done. And it's in hindsight that I start to say, oh, I can get done because it felt like it was a 10, but it wasn't a 10. And then I start to learn myself. I start to know myself. When we talked about the title, you know, using distractions to get the right thing done. Right? But for me, it's finding myself in the process and learning I can trust what's really a 10 and what's not a 10. So really, when you say using distractions to get the right things done, you're using the distraction to get to know yourself. Like, oh, I'm distracted here. I'm not really doing this. Maybe that's a signpost to tell me something about me. It's a, so the distraction sometimes is the thing I really want to do and the really thing I really should be doing that I don't know what's in store for me if I make this leap and do this crazy thing like play guitar on stage and all of a sudden I make a bunch of money because people were impressed with it and they want to be my client. Right. This thing that I thought was absolutely crazy but I knew it was a 10. So that's one thing. But then when you're on Facebook, the distraction's a 10. Right. And then you start to, I start to learn myself going, oh, I want to be distracted because this thing is hard. Is that a 10 for me? And I start to learn and I start to be able to let go of Facebook. I start to let go of, oh, going to that party because some, I, don't want to, I don't want to say no to someone. And then you say no and you go stay home and then all of a sudden you have a talk with someone you've been meaning to talk. You, know, you find out that intuition is really... Cute. So at the point in your 
in your coaching, in the evolution of your coaching business, that you were writing a book with us. I'm going to guess that you'd made a bunch of investments in your business. Mm -hmm. Certainly in working with a coach and getting certified in our program, maybe in a website or an assistant or some other things, you probably made some pretty big investments. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay, that's a big, yes. Um, I flew around the world and took every class, every really? course. I, I wanted to learn this, you know, so I invested everything into this. And you're investing here at least some portion of this time when you're not collecting your paycheck from your mm -hmm. corporate job. So we're doing this off of- Opportunity cost. Savings and yeah. What if, what if you were wrong? I think the fear of I've wasted this money or the fear of like, um, what's the sunk cost fallacy, right? Like I've invested in this coaching mentor or I've invested in this apprenticeship or I've invested in this certification or this book writing program. What if I'm not supposed to do this? What if something else is a 10? What if I get to know myself and I find out I'm supposed to be a, I don't know, a river or engineer? So you're asking a much deeper and bigger spiritual question uh, for me through the process, that went through my mind all the time. What the hell are you doing? This is crazy. This coaching business is crazy. And you're pretty you good know, at software sales. You know, <laughs> what, 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 you know, what, what, you know, the question of what, you know, at, are my kids gonna be destitute, you know, like, am I, is, is something that, but that's also part of the mastery that makes me a good coach, is I know what's the squirrel cage, and I know what's real. And if the less I spend paying attention to the squirrel cage, the false tens, the things that are taking me off purpose, this whole thing still could fall apart. Every day it could fall apart. I'm starting you know, to learn that it doesn't really matter. Who I've become through this process, I wouldn't trade for anything. That's it. If I was destitute tomorrow, and I don't plan on being, right. but if I was destitute tomorrow, this journey was the exact journey I needed to make. And I love who I am, where I am, what my life looks like. Well, that was worth it every penny. See, this is the thing. I think that people get so afraid of making an investment in doing a book with me, making an investment in coaching with you, making an investment in their business, because what if they're wrong? And it's like at the end, when your book is finished, we might find out it was the wrong book. Or at the end of a year of coaching with you, I might find out I shouldn't have invested in you. There's no way that can happen. The decision happens up front. Like the decision is, I'm gonna write this book and it's gonna be the best thing I ever did. Whether it gets published or not, whether anyone buys it or not, whether there's a thousand bad reviews and one good review. like. No matter what you decide ahead of time, this is the best decision you ever made. And that's what makes it the best decision you ever made. I like that. I like that a lot. So I see so many people who are afraid to look. They see a process like only tens versus a process like Stephen Covey's highly ha uh, or, or getting things done, David Allen. And they're like, oh, I want to look at this external process. I just want to like alphabetize my folders um, because that feels really safe. But the only time And that's why they sell millions and millions right. and millions of dollars. And pro, you know, people go from program to program to program because they haven't done the internal work. What I consider it is, you know, we can, I, in, my, in my practice, I have lots of exercises for people to do. I have lots of hacks that they can do. I have, you know, people use alarms to get things done. Or, you know, I, but it's playing whack-a-ball. Mm -hmm. And until we get down underneath, and go up, you know, go or go upstream and, and, and deal with what's falling into the river rather than trying to get everything out of the river. It's just playing whack-a-mole and it's exhausting. If I can if I can unplug a few of the things or show people things that are that are in here, then they'll be willing to do David Allen's getting things done. Then they'll be willing to do whatever program works for them. But until this thing works, none of that stuff that you're just gonna go Or it'll work for three months. I mean I did getting things done, I set everything up and then I Ignored it all. <laughs> I did take about a month to get everything set up exactly the way he I said. I still have that a label maker. Okay. I love my label I love maker. my label maker. That, that is, was that a is... great investment. <laughs> the book, the label maker. I still, get, I still get an email. I'm not knocking his program. It's great. It's cool. I get an email from every month and I want to read that thing so bad because 
because this, the, there's a part of my brain that says, I should be able to do that. I should be like that. I have, I have clients come to me all the time and say, Mark, if I could only get organized, if I could only get my shit to, excuse me, mm -hmm. my stuff together and get organized, then things are, I was like, how old are you now? I'm 45. When have you ever gotten your or something? <laughs> Forget it. Let's We're work, just going to go with this. <laughs> let's work with this. And, you know, if your office is really bothering you, we'll go to your office and we'll work one piece of paper at a time and we'll get that off. Or you'll hire someone to clean that out. But forget trying to become something you're not. There are people who are wonderfully organized and linear and all that stuff. And they can't do half the stuff you do. Stay in your zone of genius mm. and let that other stuff go away. And then we can get somewhere. But right. beating myself up because I'm not organized is crazy. Right. It's, it's so much more work to try to get organized and beat yourself up than to just accept what you're good at and do more of that, right? But I think that fear of finding yourself out, the fear of like, if I only do tens, that means I don't even do nines. Nines sound pretty good. Um, eights, I'm going to also have to give up my eights. Like, nines will kill you. I, I, I think, I read the I book. think there's I, a like, chapter. I like nine, nines will kill you because they, they just, they, they suck your energy. You'll never, they'll never come to fruition, but you'll pay a whole heck of a lot of attention to them. You'll miss the 10. Right. Yeah. I feel like not doing ones. Okay. I'm cool with that. Like not doing twos. I'm on board. And then we get to the nines and I'm like, who would I have to be to not do my nines? And I think that question is fundamentally the difference between like your work and productivity. Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, don't do nines. And they create amazing things. Steve Jobs really doesn't do them. No, no, no. <laughs> but you know, it, it's, it, there's, there's, there's a magic mm -hmm. in really trusting that process. You know, and, and I'm not saying that there aren't things that we don't like to do that we don't need, you know, if you know, um, I sit in the bleachers of my kids' baseball games. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's fall ball. It's cold. I don't like it. I get really tired of it. But I'll tell you something. The 10 is when my kid looks back and sees me there in the bleacher. That's the 10. Sitting in the bleachers is not doing it. Paying my bills is not a 10. Having, you know, being a responsible adult. Not is having a bill collectors calling. <laughs> you, know, you know, again, being, you know, like my mother, doing, doing the things I need to do to, to take care of my mother. I despise some of the stuff I have to do. I, you know, I had to do all the paperwork to move her here and get the applications. and the, I despise all that stuff. But being a, being a responsible adult and a good son and having my mother safe and secure, that's 10. Got me through. And no your other. mom is one of your big fans, right? And my son, the author. My son, the author. She, and gives, I, out, she gives out my book. I she's love in, that. There's a chapter and she's in the book. And I she love still that. gives it out. <laughs> oh, I think I remember that. So, getting through the book, great process for you um, personally, whether it got published or not. Um, you make the decision to publish it within days you're speaking about the book and other people are reading it. Let's talk about from the moment you published to today. What are some of your favorite things that have happened? What are some of the ways your life has changed since you've become a best-selling author? So the first three, four, five days after it was published, I got almost no work done. Because all I could do was look at the chart, the Amazon. Did you hit refresh? Oh my! Oh my God! You are getting this. I am number one in pathology. Who the thunk? <laughs> ADD is under pathology. Oh! <laughs> like, oh my God! Look at that! But I was, you know, just watching, watching that, just being fascinated by the fact that, you know, once my three friends bought the book, other, other people, people are did. buying the book. <laughs> you know, that was that was that was just crazy to me. So that was that was really fun. So after that, and being able to send the book out to all these people that, uh, you know, so, so my mentors along the way, my first round of books went to all my mentors, people who taught me what I, you know, uh, Steve Chandler, who wrote uh, Time Warrior, which really helped me start to figure out what boundaries were all about. You know, Alan Cohen, who actually helped me put myself on the list. I got to send these people the book and go, look what you did. 
thank you. My, my psychiatrist who gave me my Adderall, <laughs> I handed him my book and I, I went, by the way, I've been off Adderall for six months and I get more done than I've ever done. I haven't touched an Adderall since, you know, since we started this book. And I gave him that book and he loved, you know, so that was the first round. Then the second round was all these people that uh, I just loved in the world and were, you know, like, thank you for being my friend. And I just, another round of books went out and that was really fun. And then by the time, by the time I got to uh, speak at this event, uh, people knew who I was, which was really interesting. But then speaking the event and I crushed my And how many people were there? There were 200, 250 people at the event. Was that, I mean, as a sales guy, you've probably spoken. I've done presentations, like sales presentations yeah. on a stage in front of gigantic audiences of people, you know, 5,000 people or something like that. But I had never like revealed myself and really done a presentation from my heart and soul and really given my gift to a group of people who I respected more in the world. And I, again, the presentation that I was gonna do, it was about risking. Mm. So Richard asked me to speak on um, being willing to fail. And I, instead of talking to people about being willing to fail, I decided to do something. So what I did was I decided to learn to play the guitar and sing on stage. And I don't sing in public. And you've never played guitar before. You no, know, right? like I couldn't this play. So this was three months. This was just about the time we started the book. So I recorded myself learning to play the guitar. And uh, so I put that, when I did the presentation, I did a presentation on failure. I said, now I'm going to go first. We're going to ask you to go out and fail, but I'm going to go first. You know, and I, and I played the montage of me learning and it was, people were rolling on the floor. I didn't realize it was a comedy. No. <laughs> And, you know, before I started, I got my guitar out and people were like ready to go. And I said, you know, so how many people think I'm going to be great? And a bunch of people were saying, how many people think I'm going to suck? And my answer to that was, it doesn't matter. Hmm. This was my 10. This is what I want to do. And I am going to be willing to fail in front of you. I sucked. <clears throat> I sucked so bad. And I got a standing ovation. Hmm. Which is really cool because that was that was the um, that, it's just an experience that I take with everything. I could have written this book and it could have sucked. Nobody could have. You could have called me up and said, "You know, Mark, I'm really sorry, but we can't play with you anymore because you just had the worst sales of ever." Right. It, do, it doesn't really matter that you know the, the journey is the destination. Mm. That journey is and being willing to die, you know, in front of a group of people is so freeing. It's just amazing. And then after that, you know, as we said before, everybody went and downloaded the book. So the sales went up that day, you know, and people were coming up to me all over the place. They stayed up all night reading the book because the book was written for people with ADD so that they could read it on an airplane from California to New York and be done. Love it. So people read it at night and they came back and the feedback was amazing. And I got a client that night. From, uh, Actually, I put them off. I kept putting them off because I was headed to Hawaii. Oh, great. We were in Hawaii. I, I was getting again. married yeah. in Hawaii then. So I, I, uh, when I came back, you know, I got a client from, uh, then and then um, uh, a couple more clients after that. And uh, then people started calling me and I was having conversations with people just out of the blue. So it's been really fun. So putting yourself out there, um, which has been a theme over the last year, does that get easier after your book? Like putting the book out there, I think was really hard because it was one of the first times that you were like, see mm -hmm. me, judge me. You could think my book sucks. Yeah, no, if you, if you think putting out a, a blog post on Facebook is, is hard to press send, right. or if you're just doing a video, put out a book and go, hey, look, I wrote out a book. I'm an expert. I'm an authority. Yeah, I wrote so, a book. Please, uh, now I, it's, uh, pillory me. Uh, uh, does that get easier? Has that gotten easier over this year? You know, for me, it hasn't gotten easier because I just keep going for bigger and bigger things. Yeah. So, you know, this, this year I decided I wanted to do destination, you know, exotic destination workshops. I wanted to take, I want, I, I love taking people out of their environment, take them into a completely new environment and teach them something they've never seen about themselves so that their businesses and their lives can explode. So I took a dozen people with my partner, Tony Panici, to Hawaii. To, you know, part of it was swimming with dolphins and manta rays and Hawaii and all that. The meat of it was absolutely transforming lives. But again, 
to just to bet on myself, mm. uh, to bet on this idea that I want to take people to uh, to Hawaii to do this. When people said, "No, you should do it in the Holiday Inn on the side," right? Of and you know, first do it, first do it this way. I'm like, it's kind of not the way I roll. Right. And then when when I was standing on the bow of the boat at night after after my people, it was Iron Man, so there was no other boats out on the water. We were out at night you know, looking for manta rays and they were, all my people were out in the water in the middle of the night with no other boats. And I was standing on the bow watching and I was just like, I decided to create this. I put it out in the world and it could have failed and nobody could have showed up. It could, it could have been bad. People could have come all the way to Hawaii and said, this was crazy, this was a waste of money. Instead they told me it was the most transformative experience they've ever had in their lives and their businesses are gonna explode from this. That was huge. So of course the next thing was, oh, this same person that I worked with to have people out on the ocean is also does excursions to the Dominican Republic to in, in a whale sanctuary. We're gonna get on a houseboat for four days in a whale sanctuary and do this. And my mind goes, you crazy? Get back to the Holiday Inn. Right, how are you ever gonna get people to sign up? What if it's terrible, what but, if? But no, the, you know, this, if I'm really gonna follow my tens and my intuition, that's happening. Right, here's I think the big takeaway if you're looking for it to get easier, like newsflash, it doesn't get easier. And right now, the houseboat in the Dominican Republic seems hard. A year from now, I get you back on this couch, and you're gonna be like, "Oh yeah, houseboat, totally not hard." Here's what I do now: we have our own whatever private jet line. It's a, and that feels really hard. I remember having a conversation with a personal trainer. It was the first time I hired a personal trainer, and I bought a three month packet. We worked out in Reston, and I used to like Monday and Wednesday before work at 7 a.m. We'd go work out. And I bought this three month packet and it was two and a half months in. And I had been thinking this for about a month, but I finally got the courage up. I would do my whole workout thinking, how am I gonna say this to this guy? So after about a month of thinking it, I finally got brave enough to say to him, um, I don't think I'm getting any better at this. Like, at what point does working out get easier? Mm. Cause I just feel like, I keep coming every Monday and Wednesday. It's been two and a half months. And you still hate this. And I still hate this and it's still really hard. And he looked at me and he's like, oh, we just keep making it harder. He's like, you don't know that? He's like, I've increased the weights. We increased your reps. Like you're running at an incline now. Like he's like, I just keep making it harder. I'm like, you just keep making it harder. Like what am I paying for? But I felt like that was one of the best lessons from the universe. Cause that's exactly what happens. Like you get brave enough to do a book. And two weeks later, you're singing in front of 200 people. You get brave enough to sing in front of 200 people. Two weeks later, you're like in Hawaii, like deciding to like craft a whole new business. Like the challenges just keep getting harder. That actually is the point. And your muscle of being willing to risk, I think gets so much stronger. For me, I call it a practice. Mm -hmm. So every, everything is a practice. Uh, we're not, you know, for me, I don't like not being good at something. You know, I don't. So, I, so starting something is not is not easy because I'm not good at it. Uh, so I'm learning that the, the whole thing is a practice. Now, from the executives that I coach, a lot of the principles in the book really work well because the, a lot of my executives gets they're really good at what they do, so they get stuck in the weeds with their team and solving problems and, and really fighting fires. And my job is to help them to get strategic. Mm -hmm. So how do, you know, because being strategic is a 10, what is the 10 for the organization? But the organization is running at a million miles an hour. How do you take your team out, of the, out of, you know, into the field you know, just so they can reset, so that you're getting upstream and keeping people from falling into the river rather than having to take them out of the river downstream. So teaching them to have difficult conversations, setting boundaries, turning off your phone for one hour, to do that, to, you know, to do, and again, Stephen Covey talks, they all talk about it, but that internal fortitude to, that, that you're worth it and your mission in your corporation is worth it. You are the VP of IT for a reason, because you need to set strategic direction. So you, you, it's your job to take time off, mm. to set direction. And how do I get people to get that they're worth 
whether it's their worth personally or their worth in their position, is that's what they're supposed to do. You let those other people fight fires. It's, it's, they, so that's, that's the constant battle for me with people, no matter what level that they're at, whether they're, it's in their home life or in their business and you know, they can be the CEO and they're still washing bottles and you know, it's like, no, you're supposed to be doing this. You're doing your people a disservice by helping them wash bottles. You need to be up here. Mm. Love it. Totally love it. Coming into our last few minutes, I want to give you an opportunity to give some advice to people who might be thinking about writing a book, thinking about starting a business, thinking about another goal. Um, let's talk about for you, was the investment of your money, time, energy, heart, soul, all of that, um, was writing a book worth it for you? Absolutely. Perfect. Easy to answer. No question. Return on investment. Uh, return on investment personally, overwhelming. Return on investment financially, uh, probably 10 times over. Okay. Um, what, this is my favorite question I get from people when I'm uh, interviewing them to see if they're a fit for the program. I love it when people ask, uh, what, what can you do wrong in the program? Like, what is a way that people might fail? <laughs> so I, do what I did and don't, uh, don't go to the folder that says start here. There's a folder that says start here, Literally. do these things. If you do these things, the next three months are going to be so much easier for you. I missed that sentence. But I love that. It, but is that true? Because you finished. So, so what does it take to quit. succeed? So, yeah. so or what does it take to fail? Yeah. If you're going to fail, quit. Right. Don't, don't trust you, don't trust your editors, don't trust the process, quit. Uh, that would be uh, the only way to fail. If, if you just surrender to the process and to the people who are supporting you in this program, uh, the, the other way to fail is to, is to write the book and take a year or two to write the book. Mm -hmm. There's a very, it's a very rare person. There are people who write books, they're just opuses and they're beautiful and it took them 10 years to write. Um, but that's their book to birth. Right. If you want to write a book and get an idea out, having a, having a published date, the book's in you. you. You actually said that. The book is already written. It's already in you. You just need to let it out. And it sounds so new age. Right. But having a deadline, the book just has to come out. And, I, and trusting that is, is the way to get it done. What is... What's next for you? What do you want to share for people? Share with people if people want to find you, if they think they might want to work with you. They already know only tens on Amazon. Uh, we'll make sure you all have the link to that. But what do you want people to know about you, and how do you know if somebody's your person? Hmm. So what I want people to know about me is uh, that this this whole process only tens. The, the book is is not a, it's not a time management book. It's not a getting things done book. It is a book about self-discovery, and if we really slow down, we'll figure out who we are. It's part of my practice, and it doesn't matter if someone you know works at Starbucks or is the CEO. Uh, the process is the same. If you want to, if you know, a lot of my clients are up-leveling their leadership skills. To up-level leadership skills is not going to a class that tells you how to speak like a leader better. Up-leveling the leadership skills is doing your own internal work before you step foot in the office. So that's that's the kind of people do I be, I know you work with a lot of executives. Do people tend to pay you out of their own money or, do, or do, is it expense to the business or do corporations pay you? Uh, it, has been, it has been predominantly out of pocket mm. and then reimbursed. And now, because in order to get the corporation to pay you as, you know, as, as uh, entrepreneurs, if the bigger the corporation, the more hoops you have to go through. So people have been expensing it. Yeah. Uh, more and more, I'm being brought into corporations to actually do work with teams. So that's it's starting to switch over. You know, and it takes time to get the credibility for a a procurement department to be willing to part with the money. Where an individual will go, oh no, I need to work with you. So I'm now I'm getting a reputation. A second book, just for the record. There's a whole other book right in there somewhere. <laughs> There's actually three other books right in there. Oh, that's, I that's, knew it. I that's, knew that's, it. That's, that's, that's cool. So for, for, for me, it's, it's my one-on-one -on -one coaching is what I love. It's, it's what I live for, my bread and butter. Uh, the destination workshops that we're doing around the world with, uh, with Tony are just 
the, the icing on the cake for me to really do some transformational work with people. Uh, and um, and where do people find out about those or about you? Just, they just come to my, my website at markjsilverman.com. Markjsilverman.com. If you, Mark, thank you so much. This has been an amazing conversation. I think it's really the truth. We've had so many of these case studies and I think they all have something else to off offer, but the real truth here, if you're watching this and you're wondering why you haven't gotten your book done, the truth is it's just not a 10. That's really it. If it was a 10, the day after you had the idea, you would somehow be walking your dog with Robin and end up on a phone call with me. Because that's just what happens when something is a 10. If you're watching this and you're like, oh my God, this is totally a 10. I have to get on the phone with Angela. I am interviewing people in the next couple days. So the conversation that I had with Mark, we can have as well. You go to theauthorincubator.com slash apply. I will tell you in that application that you fill out, I will, I, can, I don't know exactly how, but I can kind of sniff out if it's really a 10 for you. Um, one of the things I'm looking for is people who know now is the time, this is my message, there's no time to wait. And that will come through in the application, in the interview. And I would say, and I'd love you to chime in on this, but I would say you don't have to worry about if this is going to be a mistake because if we both decide it's a fit, it's gonna be the best thing you ever did. I think your instincts are really clear on whether or not someone's ready to write a book, whether the idea is a book, because you know you don't you have a reputation to keep and you don't want to fail. Right. So that's one of the things I trusted about bringing my idea to you is you don't want to put a book that's bad. You don't want to put a book and you don't want to take money from someone who's not going to publish a book. So you were sniffing all that out with me, and that was very clear and that was very validating to me that I know I knew you wouldn't let me into the program if there was something missing. If there was something if there was something missing, I don't work with people who are not going to do what I know they need to do to get where they want to go because I have a reputation. I want my clients to be successful and be my advertising. So you, so you can trust the process of talking to Absolutely. Angela. Absolutely. Um, Mark J. Silverman, he is the author of Only Tens. It's available on Amazon. You can learn more about him at markjsilverman.com. I hope that from this presentation there is something you have learned about what is standing in the way of you and the next step for you. I've watched over the last 18 months as Mark's business has gone from something new and sort of nascent to something really exploding and incredible. Um, the return on the investment financially is awesome to hear, but the real return and the way he has stepped into the next level, the way that he has become the person who his clients are begging to work with, that to me is what this is all about. That is how he changed the world, one book at a time.